when we heard that Singapore is out of Malaysia, that was a great concern. Our economy may collapse. How are we going to survive against threats by military forces? On one hand, it was great excitement that we have an opportunity to create a nation. On the other hand, there's a great fear that this opportunity will be taken away from us. The rapid development of Singapore Armed Forces required the purchase of an extensive range of military technology, all of which had to be thoroughly tested for suitability. Together with two of my colleagues, we were responsible to write specifications for everything that we needed. The strategy was to ensure that NS men were supplied with the most suitable uniforms, rifles and helmets. Our soldiers are smaller in size than soldiers in the West. And therefore, equipment that were developed by the West for the soldiers would invariably be too heavy for us. Our army selected the AR-15 and the 5.56 caliber bullet. And the main advantage is smaller size, lighter weight, so you can carry more bullets. The helmet is a very important item for the protection of a soldier. Most of the helmets in the West were made of steel. But the Russians had a special helmet made of titanium. It was very effective, but very costly. Titanium was extremely expensive, and as it turned out, it wasn't needed, as our soldiers easily adapted to the heavier steel helmets until a new lightweight Kevlar helmet became available in January 1987. Training to defend our nation is tough, and a comfortable rest at night is an important recharge for our soldiers. So even the barrack room beds needed to be assessed. There are very few jobs in the world that you get paid to sleep on it. I'm lucky to get one of those jobs. So we test the bed and finally decided this is the bed that we will be buying for the army. As the number of NS men increased, the technology strategy turned to the challenges posed by Singapore's small size and population. We cannot compete in numbers. You can't strengthen the army with more soldiers. We need to overcome our limitations using technologies. The two major changes that give the army a quantum jump in capability was armour and artillery. We moved into the building of an armoured brigade. To provide rapid mobility and protection for our soldiers, the V200 was specifically developed for Singapore's use. Our requirement was the armour must be able to protect our soldiers from armour-piercing rounds. So what it means is that we need to increase the thickness of the armour from one quarter inch to three eight inch. And that meant that you need to have a bigger hull and bigger hull is 50% heavier in weight and therefore you need to have a new engine, you need to have a new gearbox, new transmission, a new vehicle. The V200s were modified and redeployed as ground-based air defence vehicles. So the SAF converted some of these vehicles with the RBS-70 missile and the V-200s with the RBS-70 missile are still in service today. To further enhance its capability, the Army replaced its fleet of V-200s, which had been in service since the 1970s, with the Peacekeeper Protected Response Vehicle, or PRV. Jointly developed by the Army and the Defence Science and Technology Agency, the PRV has increased mobility, offers better protection and is equipped with enhanced weapon systems which allow its crew to engage targets accurately within the vehicle. As the Army developed new technology, so too did the Air Force and the Navy, and both these services also had to be built from scratch. Singapore is a maritime nation. The sea is a main contributor to our livelihood. We need to secure the sea in order to secure our future. Singapore needed a navy instead of a coast guard to maintain the freedom of the seas. And 
therefore, we pushed as hard as we could to build the Navy to achieve our objectives. The Air Force is the most flexible force that can be launched in the shortest time and go hundreds of miles in minutes. The most important part of a fighter force besides the pilots and the aircraft is the air base. The aircraft may fly for five, six hours. The rest of the time, the aircraft is on the ground, being repaired, being armed, and turned around and so on. And that is the most vulnerable time for the fighter aircraft. So instead of having aircraft maintained on a line, you're maintaining aircraft over the entire air base. For the Battling Air Force, two kinds of service-to-air platforms were employed. In the case of service-to-air defence, we bought the British Bloodhound for high-level uh, air defence. The Bloodhound is the first unmanned aircraft of Singapore Armed Forces. It reaches out to beyond 100 kilometres downrange and 70,000 feet in height. And therefore, even the highest surveillance aircraft would be subjected to attack. We bought the latest low-level uh, air defence gun, the Olicon 35mm gun, to protect the air bases from low-level attack. With Singapore's ageing population and declining birth rates, the harnessing of technology remains vital. The armed forces will always be small in size because the size of population. In fact, the number of soldiers we have have been going down with time and therefore they must leverage on technology. We need a sustained flow of young people becoming engineers and technologists to provide the SAF with new weapon systems and upgrading of older weapon systems. Recognising this need, the defence technology community comprising of DSTA and DSO has provided the SAF with the scientific know-how and expertise to help safeguard Singapore's independence and sovereignty. Technology will enhance the capability to detect threats. We must have superior information, precision, automation and integration. A nation must be able to defend itself. Never doubt that our people will stand up to defend their country should they need a rise because they own a country. The very fact that enjoying the prosperity of the country means someone else before you had protected the country. It's your turn to protect the country for the future generation.